Hello and welcome everyone. It is September 1st, 2022, and we are here in model stream number 6.1. We're going to be discussing branching time active inference, the theory and its generality. We're going to have a presentation followed by a discussion. So thank you Ali and Jakob for joining and anyone else to be adding their questions in the live chat. Without further ado, over to Teofile Champion, and thanks so much for joining. Really appreciate it. Hello. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, and thank you for inviting me to present today. I'm very glad I had this opportunity. So today I will be speaking about branching time active inference, um, basically three different versions of the, of the, the approach. The first using biational message passing, the second using Bayesian filtering, and the third one is using belief propagation and allows uh, the model to contain several observations and several identity states. This work has been uh, realized in collaboration to, uh, with Lancelot da Costa, uh, Mark Jesch, and Howard Bowman. So first of all, I want to speak a bit about the action perception cycle, which um, is a core idea in active inference. Basically, there are two entities here. The first is the environment, and the second is the agent, which is over there. The environment provide uh, observation to the agent, for example, an image of the environment. And then the agent needs to take this input and perform inference on it. And the goal of the inference process is to extract high-level item states, such as the position of Pac-Man in X and Y, or the position of the ghost, or whatever information may be relevant. Then, based on those states, we can perform planning and action selection. And action selection outputs the action to perform, maybe the action going up, which is fed into the environment, which produces another observation. And this cycle continues until the trail ends. Now that we have the core, uh, the core idea of active inference, which is the action perception cycle, I will be speaking about active inference in a bit more depth. So basically, active inference is about an agent which is equipped of a model. This agent makes, as I said, observation, which are represented here at the bottom of the screen. And those observations depend on the item states through the A matrix. So basically, the A matrix provide a distribution of the observation for each possible latent state. We also have the G vector, which contains the parameter of the prior over the initial item state, as well as the B matrix, which explains how the transition of the environment works. So basically, it's, it's explaining how, given a state and an action, we get the new state at time t plus 1. We, as I said, uh, have an action, or here it's a policy variable. And this uh, action variable or policy depends on the precision parameter, uh, which is called gamma. And um, as we will see, influence how stochastic or deterministic the policy of the agent will be. So here we see how the prior over action is being defined. So it depends, as I said, on the gain parameter, and it is, in, and it is defined as a softmax function of minus um, the gamma, so the precision parameter, times the expected free energy. And the expected free energy for a particular policy is basically a sum over all future time steps, so from t plus 1, which is the first time step into the future, to uppercase t, which is a time horizon. And for each time step, the expected free energy is defined as the expected cost plus the ambiguity. The expected cost is the KL divergence between uh, the predictive posterior or the future observation and the prior preferences. The prior preferences defines which observation the agent wants to, to observe. And this, the predictive posterior, defines how likely each observation is. And so what we want to do is to minimize the divergence between the two, the two distribution so that we actually observe what we like. Okay, and the second term is about the entropy of the likelihood mapping. 
uh, expected under the variational posterior of a state. So I'm speaking about variational posterior. I will explain what this is in a minute, uh, but yeah, that's the definition of the expected free energy, risk plus ambiguity, or also called expected cost plus ambiguity. So I presented the model. Here's a more formal definition. Here we have a joint over all the variables in the model. We saw that the policy depends upon the precision uh, parameter. We have a gamma distribution for the precision, uh, like the, the gamma parameter. We have Dirichlet priors for each of the tensor of parameters, so A, B, and D. And we see that S indeed depends on D, and that the observation depends on the state through the A matrix. And same thing for the transition mapping, we have a state which depends on the previous states and the B matrix, as well as the action being performed in the environment. Okay, so now we have the model. But what we want to do is, given some observation, we want to be able to compute posterior beliefs over the latent variables. In a probability, uh, in probability theory, we call that computing the posterior distribution. And we do that through a process which is called inference. We can, for example, use exact inference, which is based on bias theorem, uh, so that the, like the, the posterior is equal to the likelihood times the prior. And then we normalize using the evidence. And basically, the evidence is just obtained from the numerators by summing out all the latent variable x. The problem is that when x is a continuous random variable, uh, this summation turns into an integral, and we may not have an uh, analytical solution for this uh, integral. So this method, the exact inference, can become intractable because of this. What we do instead when using variational inference is that maybe this true posterior is very complex, but we are going to approximate it using this Q, this variational distribution, and try to make the divergence between those two distributions as close as possible. So here we have the true posterior in red, and here we have an example of how the variational posterior may be fit to the true uh, posterior in red. In the context of active inference, the variational distribution is defined as follows. So it is a joint distribution over all the latent variable of the model. And we are doing what we call the mean field approximation, which means that all the variable within this distribution are assumed to be independent. Thus, there is no more dependency um, for the pi, a, b, d, and gamma parameters. And we do a slight exception where the state still depends on um, the policy pi. Uh, okay, so that's the definition of the variational distribution. And now that we have the variational distribution and the generative model, we can define the variational free energy. So the goal of the variational free energy is to make sure that the approximate posterior, so our variational distribution, remain as close as possible to the true posterior. And it is defined as the Kell divergence between the approximate posterior and the generative model. This variational free energy is also called like the negative evidence lower bound or elbow in machine learning. And it decomposes into two intuitive terms. So this is the variational free energy and it decomposes into the KL divergence between the approximate and the true posterior. This is a term that will make the approximate posterior be as close as possible to the true posterior. And here we have as uh, evidence, but which is a constant with respect to the variational distribution, which we are optimizing for. So yeah, really the variational free energy is a proxy for the first term over there. Okay, so what is variational message passing? Variational message passing is an inference algorithm. Basically, it is based on what is called the Markov block. So let's suppose we want to compute the vari like the variational posterior for one specific node in a graphical model. What variational messing expressing is about is saying that this node A only depends on its mark of blanket. More specifically, it depends on the child of A, so here D and C. It depends on the parents of A, here F and G, and also in the co-parents of A, for example, E and B in this picture. 
And what this Markov blanket says is that really we only need to know the values of the variable inside the Markov blanket to be able to perform inference over A. Here is a bit, of, a bit more formal um, view on this question. So here we have the optimal uh, variational distribution for one uh, random variable. So this could be, for example, A. And the equation on the right gives us basically the analytical solution for this uh, posterior. And we see that it's only depending on the node itself, its parents, its children, and the co-parents. And that's all we need to know. Um, okay, so why variational message passing? The message bit comes from the decomposition of this uh, analytical solution into messages, which are added together to form the variational posterior. Here we can see the first message, uh, which basically comes from the parents. Here we can see one message for each chap. And what we do is that all those messages will be added to form the parameter of the approximate posterior. Here's a graphical example. Basically, we are trying to perform inference over the random variable y. So we want to compute the parameter of um, the distribution, like the posterior distribution over y. And the way we go about doing this is that we send messages from the parents uh, all the way through the random variable y. And same thing for the child and the co-parents. And each time we reach a factor node, we combine the input messages and forward the result toward y. When we have received all the messages, we just add them together, and this provides us with the parameter of the variational distribution over y. So this was variational message passing, which is basically the algorithm that we use to perform inference. Now I will be speaking about Monte Carlo research, which is a planning algorithm that we use to look forward into the future and estimate the quality of each uh, policy. So before to do that, I want just to introduce uh, the notion of multi-index. Um, so here we can see the root of the tree, which is the state at the present time step. And then from there, we see um, that we have nodes in the future, which are indexed by sequences of indices. For example, here the sequence is the sequence of size one, which contains just the action or the index uh, one. So this is a state reached after taking action one. And then here, we have the state reached when performing action one, followed by action two. And this, those indices are called multi-index because we are, they are composed of several indices, which here represent actions. Okay, so now that we have this in mind, I can discuss Monte Carlo research. So the way Monte Carlo research is structured is in four steps. First, we have the selection step, where we start at the root node and compute the UCT criteria. So this is just a real value, like a number, for each of the child. And then we select the node, which actually has the highest UCT value. For example, maybe it is S1, so the state we reach after taking action one. Then from this, we can compute the UCT of its children, and maybe this node will be the highest value. Okay, once we have reached a lift node, we can move towards the second phase, which is about expanding the, the children of this node. And for each child, what we are going to do is just simulating some rollouts uh, from this node and computing the average expected free energy for this node. Once we have this, there is a fourth phase, which is about updating the expected free energy of the ancestor of uh, the node we just expanded, as well as the number of visits, because we want to explore part of the tree which have not been explored a lot in the past. So we need to keep track of how many times each branch has been explored. OK, so that was the algorithm for planning. And I now have introduced all the background required to discuss the first approach, which is branching time active inference with variational message passing. So first, we need to define the model. Uh, it is basically split into two parts. The first one um, represents the past and the present. And it is basically a partially observable Markov decision process 
which is just a fancy word to say that we have observations, which depends on states. This is with the A matrix. We have action variables over there, and we have states, as I said. As I said. So the likelihood mapping, as I said, is uh, having like is parameterized by the A matrix. The transition, as usual, is parameterized by the B matrix. And we also have here the D vector, which defines the prior over the initial ion states. So this is coming from standard active vectors. And then the novelty is that we are expanding the basically the future for each time. So we okay, so we have this model. Then we perform active like um, Monte Carlo research. And each time we want to expand a node, what we do is that we are going to add some parts, some bits to the generative model. So for example, if we want to add this part of the generative model, we are going to add one transition mapping, B. This will add a random variable. Uh, here it's like S12. And then we will add the associated observation using the likelihood map. So this is how we expand the generative model as we go. Mathematically, this is defined like this. So we see here a generative model over all the variables in the model. We have Dirichlet prior over the parameters like uh, of the model, so the A, B, and D matrices. The state at time step zero depends on D. Each observation depends on the states associated to it and the A matrix. And then we have prior distribution over actions, which depends on some uh, theta parameters for which we have a Dirichlet prior. Okay, and then the state, as usual, depend on the previous states and the previous actions, as well as on the B matrix, which defines the transition probabilities. So this is the PomDP version, like the PomDP part of the model. And this is a tree-like structure that it expands as planning is going on. So IT is a set of all multi-indexes which has been expanded in the model. For example, if I come back here, we see that there are three uh, multi-indices that have been expanded. So I is equal to the multi-indexes one, the multi-indexes two, and the multi-index uh, one, one. Okay, and now for each of those multi-index, we add to the generative model a transition and likelihood mapping. So that's exactly what we are doing. For each index in the set of multi-index which have been expanded, we had the likelihood mapping and the transition for the specific node in the future. Okay, so now we need to we need to test this approach in an environment. And for now, we'll be testing it inside a maze environment where we have here the exit of the maze, here the starting position. And then the prior preferences of the agent will be that the closer we are from the exits, the more the happier uh, the agent will be. So here we have a distance of zero, one, one, two, three, four. Um, one feature which is really important is that the prior preferences fly across both. So here we have we have three, and here we have four in terms of distance. We don't have like five, six, seven, eight. We have four. And what this produces is a blue cell. And what this blue cell blue cell actually is, is a local minimum in which the agent can be stuck if it is not careful. And the way to avoid this local minimum will be to be able to plan far enough into the future to see that the rewarding path is actually this one and not the one leading to the local minimum. So this is basically a challenge that we are adding uh, to, the, to the task. And here, what we can see, so here is basically an illustration of the tree, which is being expanded. And here we have the table of results. We see that as we increase the number of planning iteration, we go from the agent being stuck inside uh, the local minimum, so never reaching the exits, to an agent which is basically behaving properly and which the exits 100% of the time. Next, we need to compare how approach of branching time active inference to the previous like, state of the art, which is active inference. 
And basically, we designed um, an environment in which for the agent to be able to solve it, it has to plan three, five, and then eight time steps into the future. For Active Inference, uh, what happened is that it was able to properly solve the two first tasks. But then what happened is that because the number of policy tasks we evaluate into the future grows exponentially with the number of time steps it has to plan for, the last one, which is the biggest, uh, crushed. With how um, environments, like with how approach, we did the exact same thing. And where we increase once again the number of planning iterations, we see that the agent becomes able to solve the task uh, all the time and does not crash because it is able to explore in a clever fashion the space of all possible, possible policies using Monte Carlo research. So this was a bit of a non empirical comparison with, between BTEI and active inference. Now, what I want to do in this slide is to compare them in terms of, like, term of complexity classes, which is a lot more theoretical. So basically here, each uh, circle corresponds to a categorical distribution of a state, which means that to store one of those circles, we need to store the number of states. So, so a number of parameters, which is equal to the number of state value. OK, so if, if we have a state which takes three values, we need to store three parameters. Then for each time step into the future, we need to store one more parameters. Um, one more categorical when it comes to active inference. And we also need to store um, one more categorical for each possible policy. So the total complexity class is equal to the number of policies times the number of time steps until the time horizon times the number of parameters we need to store for each categorical distribution. Now, in the worst case scenario, uh, BTI need to store. So does not, the first thing to say is that BTI does not store every single possible combination. It's using the tree structure of the generative model to store only one distribution for the past and present. So for each time step in the past and present. And then it's if we expand all the tree, then it's going to, exp to store uh, the number of action to the power of the time horizon minus t. So this is still exponential in terms of course because of this change over there. But in practice, we never expand the entirety of the tree. So what we do is maybe we will expand this, 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 and this, but not the two other. So in practice, the real complexity class of this algorithm is uh, linear in the number of expansion that we are making. OK, so that was to show that branching time active inference does not require as much storage space as standard active inference. Now we want, I want to speak about the second approach, which is based on Bayesian filtering. So first, what is Bayesian filtering? Well, basically it is an inference algorithm which starts with just a simple generative model with a state and an observation. We actually know which observation we are making, and we have we, we also know what the, the prior of a state and the likelihood is. And then we can, for example, use Bayes theorem. Uh, to compute the posterior over states given some observations. And we just, yeah, we just compute it like this. Once we have a posterior over states, we can use it as an empirical prior. So here is our empirical prior. And we also know the transition uh, probability that leads us to the next time step. So we can use this information as well as the action that we are actually performing in the environment to compute the predictive posterior over the state at time step one, given the action that we just made, which is u0 and the observation that we made before. And the way this is done is just by performing Bayesian prediction as through the like, like the transition mapping. So averaging out the dimension of S0. And then comes another observation, and we can just use our predictive posterior that we got from the previous uh, prediction step to now um, compute the posterior over S1 according to this new observation. And those two steps of integrating evidence and then prediction um, through the transition mapping are going to be iterated as many times as we, as we need to. So this leads us to the second approach that I want to present today, which is branching time active inference with Bayesian filtering. 
So first thing, uh, we are not storing anymore uh, the past, the past observation on state, because all the information we need is stored within the beliefs over the initial state, like the current time state. The state as a current time step. Okay, so we have an observation at empty. We can perform the integration of evidence step to get a belief uh, about this, uh, this state at time step t. And then we can perform forward prediction for each of the children that we want to expand. For example, maybe we'll compute this one um, and then this one and so on and so forth. And if Monte Carlo research tells us to expand this child, then we will just perform forward prediction as well for this one and expand its associated observations. So that's the main idea. So really, the only difference here is that we don't even have any more the partially observable Markov decision process for the past. We only have, um, like, this is a current time step, and we are also changing the inference algorithm from bias mustache passing to Bayesian filtering. And here is a more formal definition of the generative model. So we can see here uh, the likelihood and prior of the state for the initial time step. Here it's the current time step t. And then for each uh, like for each future uh, state and observation, for each multi indices that we already have expanded, we have the likelihood mapping and the transition mapping associated to it. In terms of performance, uh, we compare here branching time active inference using Bayesian filtering to um, the same algorithm, so BTEI, but with variage time message passing. And we see that for the same uh, task, one of them is performing with an order of magnitude, which is about minutes scale, so around four minutes, between four and seven minutes, while the other perform a lot faster between two and 11 seconds. So this speed up in performance is basically uh, made possible by the change of uh, inference algorithm. But now what we want to do is to be able to define more than one um, observation and state at each time, time point. So the way we are going to do this is by changing once again the inference algorithm from Bayesian filtering to belief propagation. So what is belief propagation? Basically, belief propagation is an algorithm that takes as input a function over some state variables. And this function, we know that it factorizes into a set of n factors, which we call fi. And the question is, how can we compute the marginal distribution, like the marginal, uh, over, um, the marginal of this function, when we marginalize out all the other random variable except for one SM. Okay, so we want to marginalize the distribution of all but SM. And the way belief propagation is solving this task is basically by passing messages through uh, the computational graph. So in the graph, we have two kinds of nodes. We have factor nodes, which represent factors of the distribution, for example, F1. And then we have random variable, maybe uh, x1. And we may have several of them, so f2 and then x2. OK, and maybe we have a transition mapping between the, the two. So this is the setting. And now what we want to do is to pass some messages through the graph. So when it comes to a message from a node x to a factorial, so let's suppose we have one more here. What we are going to do to compute the output message is just multiply the input messages that comes from the other uh, arrows that you know, goes toward this node. And we just multiply all of the input message and output the result. When it comes to a message for, for a factor, we basically are going to uh, so take the factors for this associated to this uh, factor node and multiply it by all the incoming messages. So we take all the incoming messages and multiply them by the factor associated to this factor node. And then we marginalize out all the input dimensions 
so that the message has the exact same shape as the this one, the output as the target random variables. So this is the marginalization I'm speaking about. We do that for every single messages we can inside of the factor graph. And then we use those messages to compute the marginal that was the goal of, uh, of this algorithm. And the way we do that is that we just take all the input messages and multiply them together. And this gives us the marginal distribution over the specific state we wanted to. So this leads us to multimodal on multifactor branching time active inference, which is the last approach that we have been developing. Before to be able to speak a bit more about this approach, I need to introduce the notion of temporal slice. So a temporal slice uh, is just a set of states and observations. We have S states and O observation. Which, so this is a plate notation which just duplicates the variable O time or S time. And then we have those dashed lines. What those dashed lines are doing is just connecting the observation to a subset of the states over there. So for example, maybe we have an observation one, which depends on state one and state two. And then maybe we have observation two, but this observation two only depends on state two. So the reason for which it's a dashed line is because we can have a pass, sparse mapping in uh, between the state and observation. We don't have to have all the possible connection. Okay, and two slides, uh, two temporal slides can be connected through the transition mapping, which is these arrows. And what these arrows mean is exactly the same, but between two time steps. So, for example, this uh, the state over there can depend on the state at the previous time step in an arbitrary fashion, exactly like the observation depend on the, an arbitrary subset of the state. But this representation is a bit unpractical when it comes to representing the entire generative model. So what we do is that we just represent this temporal slice as a square, which is called TST. So the temporal slice at time T. And the background here, here is gray, because the observation within the temporal slice are provided. They are actually observed. While in the future, the background will be white uh, because the observation are just not observed. OK, so now that we have this more compact presentation, we can present uh, the generative model. So here we see the initial time step. And then from there, we can expand some new temporal slice, exactly when uh, Monte Carlo Research asked us uh, to. So we start there. Maybe we compute the UCT criterion. This is uh, the highest, uh, the node with the highest UCT criterion. So we are basically asked to expand those children. And we can do so by just using the forward prediction uh, for computing the state here. And then from the state, we use forward prediction once again uh, to predict the future observation associated to this temporal slice. OK, more formally. This uh, generative model is a joint of the all the random variable, once again. And it is the product of the probability of the temporal slice at time t multiplied by all the future time temporal slice. OK, so all the temporal slice we have already been expanding during Monte Carlo research. Each observation depends, uh, so in the initial temporal slice, so this is the initial temporal slice. Each observation depends on a subset of the state within this uh, temporal slice. And because we are at the top of the tree, the state at time step t does not depend on anything. After that, for each temporal slice in the future, we still have the dependency on um, that. We still have the fact that the observation depends on the state within this temporal slice. But we also have the fact that the state in this temporal slice depends on the state in the previous, like the parent temporal slice. So for example, the state within this temporal slice have parents in, inside this uh, temporal slice. Okay, so this is the way the generative model is defined. Now, the way we perform inference is using what we call the IP, IP algorithm. So I stand for inference and P will stand for um, prediction. So this slide is about the inference step. And the goal is to compute the posterior 
over the state within uh, the initial, like the, the current temporal slice, given the observations. I'm not going to go through this derivation. You can pause the video if you are watching it on YouTube. Um, but yeah, so basically we do some derivation and then we obtain this solution, which just tells us to take the product over all the likelihood mapping with all the priors and then use the belief propagation to actually marginalize out this uh, function. And that's exactly uh, what we are going to do. We use belief propagation within the current time step. So if I go back here, we have some observation here, and we use belief propagation to compute the state within the initial top wall slice. So this is the E step, uh, the I step, which is the inference step. Then we need to perform the P step. Each time the Monte Carlo tree search tells us to expand a part of the generative model. So once again, I'm not going to go through this derivation, but basically the idea is to compute the posterior over the state in the next temporal slice, given the observation that we made in the current temporal slice. So here we see that basically, once again, we have some kind of uh, summation over all the parents of the states in the temporal slice that we want to, to, to compute the, the posterior for. And um, this is the transition mapping that we know. And this is a posterior distribution from the previous temporal slice. So basically what we are doing is just doing forward prediction in this case, taking the expectation of the transition mapping. We can do this for the state and for the observations. So to come back to the main picture, we first use the I step to compute the posterior over the state as the initial time, uh, temporal slice. So this is the I step. And then we can use this post those posterior distribution to compute the posterior over the state in the future. So maybe the state in this temporal slice. And then we can use, once again, the P step to compute the distribution over future observations that correspond to this temporal slice. And we are going to go that to, to do that for all time step, like um, all temporal slides we want to expand in the future. Okay, and the next thing that we need to define and last for this approach is the expected free energy. So basically, the way we are going to define this is by first grouping all the observation into distant uh, subsets. So basically, OI is a set of all observation in the temporal slice index by the multi-index I. Okay. And now we are going to split Once we have grouped those observations into subsets, the way we define the expected free energy is just as a sum over all possible uh, groups of random variables. So each of those, we will iterate over those. And then into the Kell divergence between the prior preference and the predictive posterior for those observations. So this is the risk term the clear divergence between what will happen and what we want to happen. And then we will, we will compute the ambiguity for each of the observation, which is as usual defined as the expected entropy of the likelihood mapping. So this part equation uh, is probably new for people, uh, for, for people that have not read the paper, but we can look at one specific case, which makes it a more, more intuitive. And basically, this specific case is just when each subset corresponds to one observation um, in the temporal slice. And in this case, the expected free energy for a specific policy, so for one specific multi-index, is just the risk for the specific observation plus the ambiguity for the specific observation. So we, we still have ambiguity plus uh, risk. And now we need um, to present, like, to test those approaches together. So compare branching time, active inference with bias time message passing, Bayesian filtering, and the last approach, which is based on belief propagation. The way we are going to do that is by using uh, a variant of the described data sets. Basically, um, we represent 
the, the environment as a grid. And so we, in, okay, in this environment, we have three different shapes. We have ellipses, hertz that need to be pulled towards the bottom right corner of the image. And we have squares. And the squares need to be pulled on the bottom left corner of the image. And because there are way too many um, position in X and Y, what we do is that we do some form of state aggregation. And for the eighth first position in the right left corner, um, upper uh, left corner, if the shape is in one of those eight position, we are going to aggregate them into one state with index zero. And for this, it will be in index one and then and so on and so forth, like two, three, four, up to 19 for the squares. And if it's a hertz, we will just allocate those states, um, the indices between 20 and 39. And same thing for ellipses. So what we are doing is basically reducing the state space so that some of those approaches can still do something because they are not powerful enough to solve the entire um, state space. So here are the results where we compare variational mismatch passing, Bayesian filtering, and the last one, which is based on belief propagation. Bayesian um, variational mismatch passing, we had to use a granularity of four, which means that the length, like the, the size of the square, is like a four by four set of like a square. So the cell has a size of four by four. And with this setting, we were able to solve 96% of the task. And the average uh, time for one, um, for one trial is around five seconds. With the Bayesian filtering uh, approach, we were able to go down to a granularity of two. So this time the cells are the size of two by two. And with this, uh, the, with this granularity, the agent becomes able to solve the task 98% of the time. While, um, but the, the thing is that because we reduce the size of the granularity, we also increase the size of the state space. And this produces an, like, an increase in computational times, uh, which means that each trial now requires around 17 seconds to be executed. For the last approach, Basically, we use the fact that we now know the factorization of the likelihood and transition mapping. And this allows us to go down all the way to on, like only one, a granny of one, basically. So we are now able to differentiate between every single X and Y position inside the image. And with this granularity, we can solve the task perfectly. And because we can take advantage of the like factorization of the distribution, we go a lot faster uh, than all of the previous approaches. And we can solve the task in around 2.5 seconds. So just, I would just want to make one thing uh, very clear here, because this approach basically was able to model every Y position, every X position, every shapes inside, like every shapes uh, of the despite environments, all the orientation, like possible orientation of the shape, and all the scale. Um, so basically each, each shape can have different sizes and this scale dimension uh, represent that. So basically this approach was able to, to deal with around 700,000 configuration of the state space. Now we have presented the results and show that this approach, approach is um, very performance, like can lead to very good performance. But now how do we create that? Uh, well, here I've got a very small uh, code example where basically I'm re retrieving from the environment the A, B, C, and D matrices. The C matrix, C matrix corresponds to the prior preferences of the agent. And as I already said several times, A corresponds to the likelihood, uh, B corresponds to the transition, and D is a prior of the initial state. And then the way we go about creating the BTI 3MF agents is just by creating a temporal slice builder, telling him that we have one action, which is called uh, A underscore zero, and then giving it the number of value that it, uh, this action can take. Then we just add one state for every single state of our system. So the X position, Y position, shape, scale, and orientation. 
and we provide as a second parameter the like the parameter of the prior over the state. So now within our generative model, we have the state of the system. Then we need to add the observation. Basically, for each of the states, we add one dependent, um, one observation, which depends on the state through the A matrix. So we provide the A matrix and the list of parents over there. And this basically will add an observation for each state in the generative model. The before last step is just um, to add transition. So basically, for each state in the system, we say what is the B matrix that need to be used and what are the, uh, the parents for this state. So for example, the position in X of the agent depends on the position in X at the previous, previous time, time step and the action which is being performed. And this will basically add transition probabilities within the model. And the last step before to build the temporal size is just to, to define our prior preferences. And um, because in the display data set, we need to have prior preferences about the X, Y, and the shape of, um, of a blob. What we do is that we, we say, here's one factor. So this is one of the X subset of observations. And we provide the C matrix associated to that. Then we call the, the function build, which just return the temporal slice. And we create a BTEI 3 map agent, which uses this temporal slice. And we provide the number of iter planning iteration we want the algorithm to use, as well as the exploration constant that trade offs exploration versus um, exploration, exploration versus exploitation. And um, this is a graphical user interface that we have been developing. Basically, here we can see uh, the initial temporal slice. And uh, if we were in the software, we can click on the temporal slice and see the different posterior over all the, the, the state variable. We can also uh, see different information about those as this temporal slice. So the number of times have been visited and all this stuff. And then we can use the button on the on the right, on the left, to basically perform a step-by-step -step Monte Carlo research. So what will happen in the interface is just we are going to add the children. And then we will be able to click on those children to explore uh, those parts of the trees. So, and we will have information about the temporal slice in the future. So that's an analyze, uh, a tool that you can use to analyze both planning and the beliefs of the agent. Okay, so I'm now um, done with presenting the different approach. It's now time for me to conclude this presentation. So we have seen three different approaches. The first is based on bias and mustache passing, and obviously using active entrance and Monte Carlo research. The second is based on belief um, Bayesian filtering. And the last one is based on the IP algorithm, which is a mixture of belief propagation and forward prediction. And in terms of performance, the first, so BTEI VMP, uh, was basically slower, like less performant than the second one, which is was uh, less performant than the third one. Okay, but even with this uh, increase in terms of performance ability from one approach to the next, there are still some tasks that we cannot solve. For example, how do we solve image-based problem? Or um, it is not clear how we can learn the structure of the generative model. For now, the, the modeler has to provide the description of the model but uh, it would be very nice if we could learn it from the data. And also, for now, we have been basically providing the agent for uh, like with sec useful sequences of actions. For example, if we go back to the display environment, we could imagine a task where each time we go right, it's only pushing the shape one, one position on the right, and then one more, and then one more. But what we have been doing to make planning tractable is just by chunking all those actions together and maybe executing like eight actions all together or maybe four actions all together. But this has its limitation and it will be really nice if we could learn sequences of action like this automatically. But that's all I wanted to say. Uh, here are a few references if you want to, to look them up after the presentation. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, indeed.
use our reactions. Well, very interesting. A lot of material and things for us to discuss. I'll start with just one general question and then Jakob and Ali looking forward to your questions. Just for some context, how did this team and you come to be working on this problem? Were you working on active inference and interested in extensions or were you working in a different adjacent area and came to this algorithm? Okay, so maybe one thing that I should have said is that I'm, I've been starting, like I started a PhD at the University of Kent and um, basically Howard and Marek, which are two of my collaborators on this project, uh, are my supervisors. So this is how we, we came up to, to work together just through my PhD. And Lost to La Costa is a collaborator that I've been uh, working with because I I've been doing some presentation at the film, uh, which is the Institute of Neuroscience, um, where Carl Finston is. And by this through a presentation, like during a presentation, Lost to told me that he was um, interested in working with me. So this is how I started working with Lost to La Costa. And um, so in terms of my background, I'm coming from a very computer science-like uh, school full into coding. And then I arrived at um, the University of Kent, where I started to study about machine learning. And this is where I started to gain some experience into um, reinforcement learning or even active inference. And uh, basically, who Howard Bowman was initially, and Mike Jess as well, was uh, were two of my teachers. And Howard Bowman was already interested in uh, active inference. And one, one day, basically after the classes, I came on see him and say, "Well, I, I would be interested to a side project," and that's how whole, everything started. And I ended up doing a PhD after that. So that's it. So basically, a bit of both. I come from machine learning, my guess as well. Uh, Lancelot comes from pure mathematics, and Howard comes from uh, like neuroscience, and he is a guy which bring in the active inference subject to the table. Excellent. Thank you. So I have many more questions, but how about Ali first with a question? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot for your uh, amazing presentation. Uh, I really learned a lot. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments, if I may, um, and uh, maybe a, a bunch of questions. Uh, well, as you're well aware, active inference slash FEP research has been going on recently in um, basically two distinct paths. Uh, the theoretical work geared uh, mostly toward developing the underlying foundational principles, for example, the work of uh, Dalton, Sakti Vadevel, and Maxwell Ramstead and colleagues comes to mind, hmm. and the more application-oriented research, um, perhaps not unlike the distinction between theoretical and experimental physics a line hmm. of researches. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if you'd agree uh, with me on this, but uh, it seems to me that uh, sadly the application-oriented research and uh, especially the work on the uh, various algorithmic implementations of active inference uh, has not gained as much recognition as it should, uh, at least as compared to the research and uh, theoretical side. Um, I mean, the amount of uh, related published uh, literature is uh, pretty scarce comparatively. So uh, in light of this context, uh, your line of research uh, seems to me a lot more daring and uh, gains uh, much more significance. So I wanted to con congratulate on that. Uh, but uh, you see, I'm a big fan of uh, unification in science and technology. So my per first question is about um, your opinion on the possibility of uh, uh, kind of uni uh, unifying the different, uh, unifying uh, the different algorithmic implementations of active inference. Um, as an example, uh, you just mentioned the uh, automatic learning of the structure of the generative uh, model as a possible um, a subject for future um, research. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen uh, what here at all. A very recent pa paper from a couple of weeks ago, uh, namely uh, learning generative models for active inference using tensor networks, uh, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. uh, which outlines an interesting physics-inspired approach uh, for that uh, task. 
Uh, but um, it doesn't include any citations to any of the uh, branching time active inference um, papers, probably because they weren't aware of your work at the time of their writing. But uh, this works, uh, work looks to me as a pretty good candidate for a potential uh, integration with uh, BTAI in order to overcome some of the uh, limitations you just mentioned. Uh, or another recent example uh, would probably be uh, Sanesh uh, et al.'s uh, paper deriving time averaged uh, active inference from control principles, uh, which is an attempt uh, to derive an infinite horizon um, average uh, surprise formulation of active inference. Um, so I really liked your comparative overview of the different variants of uh, branching time active inference, especially the benchmark analyses. And um, uh, I know you described a sophisticated active inference in your work as a subset of branching time uh, active inference. But uh, regardless of these specific examples I just mentioned, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how do you see the future of BTAI in terms of its uh, possible unification with the other variants of active inference implementations, each with its own pros and cons, um, in order to overcome some of the uh, so, uh, some of their limitations without compromising the advantages of each. Uh, I mean, do you see it as a possibility that uh, branching time active inference will uh, one day uh, subsume all the other approaches somehow in a truly integrated uh, kind of framework? So to be honest, I, I don't exactly know. Uh, I, I the only like part of the literature that I've been exploring the connection with branching time active inference has been um, active inference and sophisticated inference. Um, I won't be really speak about this in the presentation, but I can quickly give the idea of uh, what the, my work has been like, what has been the conclusion of this. And basically, um, it is really about how we back propagate um, what I call the local expected free energy, which is basically uh, the expected free energy associated with uh, one node in the future. And so if you back propagate those upward in the tree, following um, like Monte Carlo research, which basically comes from Ben Mann's equations and all this kind of um, like literature in reinforcement learning, you will fall into, um, you will end up with an approach, which is very close to sophisticated inference. Uh, basically because sophisticated inference is also taking some inspiration into um, the Benman equations, just applying it to the expected free energy instead of just having reward. Uh, if you go downward, so if you back propagate those local, local costs towards the future, then what you are effectively doing is just computing like the path integral of the expected free energy. And so this will be active inference just taking the sum of the all future time step of, of the expected free energy, basically. Uh, so this was sophisticated inference, and this would be active inference. Now concerning the other approaches um, that you mentioned, I haven't been reading um, those papers, so I can't really state on that. Um, but yeah, I believe that branching time active inference is a fairly general framework. So it may be the case that some of them will be related, but more research is needed on this this side. Thank you Great. so much. Great comments. Jakob, do you have any question? Yeah. Um, once again, th thanks a lot for the awesome presentation. It, defini it definitely explained a lot of uh, things that I didn't understand on, uh, on my uh, reading through, through the original paper. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, again, going back to the question of learning the structure of, of the different components of the generative model, um in in your paper you mentioned you mentioned uh using um deep neural networks as general function approximators for learning this uh the state space representation and i'm wondering yeah. whether you have given some thought of into how neural networks might fit into this factor graph representation of the generative model mm -hmm. and i guess i guess there are perhaps also two ways to look at learning the structure of, of these different components. One is uh, just the initial step of, uh, in your slide when you showed the kind of initialization of the model, uh, getting the A and B tensors, the, the prior prefer the preferences and, and um, the prior beliefs 
kind mm -hmm. of replacing that step with uh with deep neural networks to learn the representations mm -hmm. but perhaps there's also another uh, another side to um where you could dynamically change the dimensions of these different components as in perhaps the agent receives an observation that wasn't captured in the likelihood mapping of the a tensor or perhaps it's a multi-agent mm -hmm. setting where one agent has affordances the other agent doesn't and a new transition mapping needs to be learned through observations uh so i'm uh wondering what your thoughts are on this and how you think this might be compatible with branching time active inference okay so uh, the deep learning um area is i think really interesting and should be uh, enabling uh, active inference to scale to a more complicated task and more recently so this is, paper is not yet out but i'm working on a deep learning version of active inference so for now there is no uh, branching time inside the picture so there is no multi carrot research and the reason is because it's already uh, surprisingly difficult to make it work just for active inference and um basically i've been reviewing some of the paper in the literature and i and then i provide my own implementation of uh, deep active inference but uh, for example i speak i spoke about the this private data set and I was not able to make uh, deep active inference work on these approaches, uh, on this um, on these environments. So yeah, and I've been doing a presentation as a field about this. Uh, but basically, some of the implementation of the internet contain mistakes. Um, and yeah, some of the paper also contains some like, I mean, I'm not sure if for the paper it's like mistake, but that's that I don't understand. And um, for now, the, the authors I've not been able to to answer my questions. Um, so basically, what I'm trying to say is that I've been trying to implement deep active inference, and surprisingly, it's quite difficult to make it work at least on the despite uh, environment. So there will be a first paper about analyze, analyzing what the deep neural networks are actually learning and why it is failing on these environments, and then. Um, what I wanted to do is to try to apply this implementation that I hope is correct um, to different tasks, uh, more sp especially like the Atari games and stuff like this, and try to find out whether there are some tasks for which uh, the expected free energy and you know this implementation of deep active inference can actually solve the task. And the pre preliminary result that I have on this um, is that there seems to be some task for which uh, deep active inference um, is actually performing better than, for example, a DQN, which is a benchmark from the reinforcement learning literature. And uh, yeah, but it's not as um, as straightforward, basically, uh, as it seems um, for now. It's, it's quite challenging to, to implement that. So that was more for like the, um, the deep learning aspect. Uh, I think it's, we still need to work quite a lot before to, to make something very robust. Uh, that can beat uh, more standard reinforcement learning for like benchmarks. And uh, yeah, the other approaches to structure learning, I have not been able, like I have not researched it for now. So I will need more time to, to think about a, a more robust answer to the question. But uh, yeah, that's basically what I had to say. Thank you, Lance. One really striking aspect of the presentation was the analysis of the computational complexity. So mm -hmm. maybe we could return to this because it's something that we've wondered about and discussed on a few occasions. Yeah. You presented the theoretical complexity classes with a big O notation, and then yeah. also discussed some of the practical aspects of the actual like clock time on a given hardware wasn't exactly sure what language um, or um hardware you ran it on but um provided the theoretical yeah. complexity class as well as some runtime provisioning so i was yeah. curious to hear some thoughts on how does this big o computational complexity analysis shine light on different variants of active inference as well as branchy time active inference and what real computational resources were taxed in the analysis 
Was this a RAM overflow that caused the crash that you referenced earlier? Is it a CPU throttling? Is it paralyzable? Does it require temp files? Like what in theory is happening with the computational complexity and the exponential blow up? And then what in practice is going to facilitate this kind of analysis to scale? Okay, so first thing, like this complexity analysis was done in terms of the space, which is required to store all the parameter of the, you know, distribution of the states. Okay, so here we are really interested in how much space do I need in order to store all the distribution of the states, like all the posterior distribution of the states. And that if what happens uh, in standard active inference, is that the number of policies that will be available to the agents. So let's suppose we have two actions. We have one here, one here. Okay, action zero, action one. Here, at the first time step, there are two actions. At the second time step, there will be four of them, like four policies, basically, that the agent can, um, can actually perform. It can go for zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And this number of policy will basically be multiplied by two each time step, uh, like further down the road, right? Because each time we can now pick each of the action again for each of the previous policies. And this exponential growth is quite problematic. Um, for, for example, the prior of a policy. So if you remember, um, this definition for the prior of the policies, we see that in order to define the prior, over the policy, we need to compute the expected free energy for each of those policies. But we need to do that for an exponential number of them as uh, the time horizon of planning increases. So this is the first problem. And also, this exponentially, uh, exponential explosion is not limited to the number of policies because we still remember, okay, so maybe for this one, I need to go um, and look at the variational distribution uh, which is used in variational inference, but we see that the number, like the variational posterior of a state depends on the policy. So for each of the policy, we need to store a distribution of a state. And this is once again a problem because there's an exponential number of policy, which means that there is an exponential number of, um, of uh, variational posterior that we need to store. So this is the kind of problem that happens um, within um, standard active inference. The number of policy is growing exponentially. And we also need to store uh, the distribution of a state for each time step. Now, where branching time active inference becomes useful is that it uses a structure, like there's a graph structure, to avoid to have to store every single single possible combination of uh, you know time step versus policy, and so this those two we see that is growing linearly is because we just keep in memory one distribution for each state in the past and present, and only when it comes uh, the current time step do we start imagining what's going to happen in the future, and this growth. Is still exponential. Like if we had to, if we had to explore every single possible policy in the future, we will still have an exponential growth. But because we are using Monte Carlo tree search, basically we are going to only explore a small amount of the tree, and this is where the complexity moves from exponential to linear into the with respect to the number of expansion of the model. So each time we expand. A new branch in this model, we need to store one more categorical for this uh, future time step, basically. And so this is how, uh, like, we can move from an exponential um, complexity class into a linear one with respect to the number of expansion of the generative model. Uh, so that was for the complexity class. Uh, in terms of hardware, it was basically just on my own computer. Uh, so no graphical uh, GPU used, nothing like this, just CPU, basically. Very interesting. And on the hardware or on the implementation side, where do you see packages in Python or Julia 
like Forney Lab and the reactive message passing paradigm being developed? Or do you see GPUs as being relevant? Like this is the storage consideration. What mm -hmm. kinds of scaling relationships or in theory and practice, how are the operational aspects of the computing rather than the space requirements computed? So first thing to say is that the space complexity is also linked to the time and you know computational complexity. Um, because, for example, as I said when I was speaking about the, um, the prior of a, of a policy, if we have an exponential number of policies, we need to compute an exponential number of expected free energy for each of those policies. So, and, and same thing for when it comes to the posterior, when, when we have to store the variational posterior and that there is an exponential number of them, then we also need to compute them. So this will also become intractable in the long term. And um, in terms of implementation, I know that some people have been developing like Fornet Lab in, in, uh, in Julia. Uh, I've been providing my own implementation in Python. Um, so yeah, those are possibilities. In terms of uh, GPUs, I guess their usage will be um, really useful only if the, if the graphical model allows for parallelization. For example, one case where the GPUs are very useful is for images because each position in the image can generally be uh, processed in parallel. So if we had like a generative model where we had, I don't know, likelihood mapping for just four pixels next to each other, like a patch in the image, and we had to compute the, the, all the posterior for all the image, then there is a very large potential for parallelization. But if, for example, uh, a message has a dependency on a previous message, then there will be um, just a part of the GPU which is just waiting for the input message to arrive. So there is also um, particular limitation on that because some of the analytical solution require some other messages. So there are some dependency throughout uh, the dependency, like the, the graphical model, by the way. So using GPU, yes, but probably in specific generative model for which it's useful, such as image-based generative model. Or um, so yeah, this kind of generative model. If we have something which is very simple, uh, then I think it's not going to benefit a lot from uh, GPUs computation. Excellent. Thank you. Um, no welcome. Ali again, or Jakob, if you'd like another question, or I can ask one. Yeah, I also wanted to ask about uh, the different um, the possible future implementations of branching time active inference because um, Daniel and Jakob knows <laughs> know that I'm a, a big Julia fan. Uh, so uh, I wanted to know if there's a plan to uh, have a Julia implementation of branching time active inference because uh, I think uh, we already have a C++ and uh, Python, if I'm Correct, right. The first branching time active inference was implemented in C++ and uh, the multimodal one in uh, Python. Uh, yeah. So uh, what are the future plans for uh, the other, uh, other forms of implementation of BTAI? So for now, I was just planning to just use Python, um, but I guess it should not be too hard to port it in Julia. And just for now, I don't have the usage for it. Um, but yeah, like, uh, and also for like future possibility when it comes to branching time active inference, uh, I've been starting to work on trying to implement a SLAM algorithm. Um, so this uh, is a simultaneously location and mapping. So basically we create a map of the environment as we navigate through it. So this is also like a possibility, uh, but within this uh, context, basically uh, was going to grow exponentially that we can have observation that depends on a very large number of states. And therefore, what we need to have is more like a, a conditional probability table, which is stored as a tree. So it's basically, um, you can encode rules within the conditional probability table. Uh, for example, you have, let's suppose that you have, uh, okay, probability of C given A and B, then maybe, if A is equal to one, 
you want to have um, a branching on B, and then we have 0, 1. And maybe this is 0 0.9. Okay, okay, so what this means is that if A is equal to 1 and B is equal to 0, then the probability distribution of a C is going to be 0 0.1 for the first value and 0 0.9 for the second value. And so basically, the, the idea is to try to not represent the entire table, but use a tree structure to encode rules about the dynamic of the world and the likelihood map function as well. And then the challenge is to be able to perform forward prediction from this tree and inference also from this tree. Uh, so this is a, another feature which may be integrated inside um, BTI in the future. It's definitely a theme that runs through a lot of these discussions is representing objects as trees and then yeah. taking the tree turn or the forest mm -hmm. turn seriously because the tree structure allows us to avoid redundancies and enables some new types of analyses. Jakob, do you have a question or I can ask one? Yeah, uh, maybe um, continuing on the SLAM thread, I'm wondering whether uh, you're consi considering the application of SLAM to the um, image classification problem and perhaps how the image classification problem needs to be reframed to even fit this, uh, well, First of all, branching time active inference scheme, but overall active inference scheme, because uh, it seems that active inference overall is much better suited to these kind of continuously evolving problems where the gener generative process uh, changes whenever um, the agent takes actions, whereas an image classification problem seems to be w way more static, which uh, at least in the in the machine learning scheme, it's just input yeah. and output, and then perhaps uh, some um, error um, that gets back propagated through the network. Um, so I'm wondering how you um, how you are thinking about um, image compa uh, image classification with uh, mm -hmm. active inference, and overall just how images can act um as input in in um dynamical environments so yeah thank you for the question once again um this is so basically the thing with like image classification is that we don't have this temporal structure like you just mentioned which make it quite difficult for an active inference agent to be applied to this in some sense it's a bit like the transition mapping is is like an identity function in some sense like or um, yeah it's a bit difficult to think about how you can bring it but yeah because each time step could be one image for example is a classification um but i think active inference is just not really well suited to to something like this for classification i think there are like just classification models like you know whatever resnet or whatever which are much better suited um basically if you had to apply active inference it would have to you have to would have to change uh, the structure of the model uh, to remove that it is a temporal uh, transition and just to have observation. Um, or otherwise, you will need uh, some kind of dynamic environments like the Atari games, Pac Man, or this kind of, of thing, or like the D sprite environments. And in this case, you can model the temporal dynamics of uh, the environments. And so here, active inference really helps because you can, you know, think about action and how they impact the transition. And you can have um, so basically an encoder that will compress the image. So you will have technically uh, an image here. You will have an encoder networks, a bit like a, in a via channel to encoder that will uh, produce a parameter, so the mean and the variance of um, a distribution of a state. And then we will have the decoder over there, which produce another image from the latent variable, basically. And then we will have here like a transition networks, which is also a deep neural networks, uh, which outputs as uh, a mean and variance of a distribution over the state at the next time step. And uh, yeah, and then here you will have another encoder for the future image and another decoder for the, the future image as well. And 
this transition networks will have to take into account basically the action as well as the states to predict the next state. So that's the kind of architecture you will need to create a deep active inference agent. And I think it's better suited to dynamic environments like attack against than it is for static environments. Um, this is indeed a lot more complicated to apply it to. If I could give a few thoughts on image slam. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating point about static analyses and dynamic analyses. And so what are some ways that we could pseudo dynamicize the image classification task? So a few options. One of them is navigation amongst large databases of images. Mm -hmm. So potentially choosing informative examples for training in large empirical image databases or frames from video or in a dynamic feedback with prompt engineering for AI generated images. So then it makes it into a dynamic question response um, task. That would be using um, dynamics at the level across images, but still taking in the whole image. And one other approach could be building on some of the ocular motor active inference models of mm -hmm. attention, only taking in a small amount of the image potentially reducing the state space or the computational complexity vastly, and then making the dynamics of some lower level entity related to policy selections on eye movements or attention, and then treat that as like the lower level of the slam and the classification. What kind of image am I looking at as a higher level of a slam, but the policy is being enacted at the level of which parts of the image are being scanned? Yeah, that's indeed a very nice set of ideas, which require modification of the task, uh, but is indeed pretty much more, like much better suited to active inference. Um, so very interesting. I wanted to also ask about um, two modules or functions that various other active proposals have had, which are hierarchical nesting of models mm -hmm. and learning. So yeah. how do nesting and learning influence the theoretical and the realized computational complexity? So I think like having hierarchy can really help reduce the computational complexity of an active inference agent. Um, for example, one idea would be to, so I was speaking about generative model over images. Uh, imagine you had like an image and then so an image can be like, it's millions of possible combination, right? Like not even more than that, but probably more than atoms in the universe. But what you could do is like a bit by imitating the structure of a convolutional neural networks. Maybe you can create over a patch of pixels, a generative model that we extract, for example, different line patterns. So maybe uh, horizontal, like or diagonal lines or horizontal lines. And so you will have a first level of your the hierarchy, which will extract those informations. And then you will have, you know, pattern of patterns and so on and so forth. And I think you can create this, um, you know, as a categorical distribution, but in a hierarchical uh, model, basically. At the very beginning, you have pixels, and then you have uh, small edges and stuff like this, then combination of edges, and up, all the way up, basically, to, to having objects. Um, but this is very complicated. Like, um, in terms of implementation, we will require to like probably use GPU for the inference process because there will be a very large number of patches. Uh, so we will need to speed up the, the training. But still, I think this is a very good way to reduce the state space of the, of the agent. Because if you try to, to basically put an image as input of a standard active inference agent, you will have to have like, yeah, like more possible image as the number of atoms in the universe, even for relatively small images. So hierarchy can really help on that. Um, and sorry, you had another question, right? Other than- um, this, The second aspect was about learning. For example, yeah. what if we update our priors as the tree continues, or we want to consider mm -hmm. policies on priors or other types of updating of our um, different parameters that might be fixed in other settings? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So one thing to say about um, having learnable priors is that in some cases this could go really wrong. So if you don't like, okay, imagine you have observations and you have states. So those are the observations, uh, or yeah, sorry, this is the states, and this will be the observations. So three possible states, two possible observations. And if you start with a Jewish state prior, which is just fully uniform. So maybe the parameters are all one everywhere. Well, what's going to happen is that if you make one of the observation, it's just going to give you as much um, like the entrance process will infer a uniform distribution of the states because the weights within the matrix are basically all one. So there's for each observation, there is no real like state which will be more likely to to basically generate it, which means that the inference process will have a uniform distribution of a state. And basically, this is a problem because what you will end up having is like a, a, a matrix where maybe some states are more likely, but each state is not more likely to generate different observations. And so basically there is a, a failure of learning because it's just not able to like if you have a okay, so if you remember the, the way we update the parameter of the Jewish layer, it's just by counting the number of state observation pair that we have been observing. And if the state which is observed is always is always like one point, uh, like one third, for example, like if it's a uniform distribution, then it's going to count one third of the observation for all the state at the same time. And we are not able to identify which state has been able to uh, generate this observation because they are all as likely to generate these observations. And so, what is going to happen is that your Jewish layer just cannot learn which state generates which observation. It's just counting the number of time a state has appeared, but not, you know, with respect to observations. So, this is a gen degenerate case, which shows that having matrices, for example, uh, with the richly priors and stuff like this, can fail to ruin the dynamic of the environment and the likelihood of the environment as well. So maybe having deep neural networks can, you know, avoid this problem. Uh, but yeah, it seems that's a real challenge. Like learning the parameters within an active inference model seems to require like a human to first give it a first draft where the the likelihood, like, like the prior is not uniform when it comes to the Jewish layer, if the model is to be able to learn. So this is one of the challenge uh, for learning in active inference. Hmm. It's something we've come across in specifying the state space and what policies are possible. And it it's an interesting conversation because it brings us as modelers into engagement with the model and mm. helps clarify where are we setting scaffolds and constraints? What information are we, what manifolds are we placing that agent into that mm. set it up? Oh, it's rolling downhill within some mm. super local context. Even if that local context is still enormous in its state space, it may still be just a tip of the iceberg in terms of the total model structures. And that's not even to say we need to explore the total model structure in practice, but in theory, it's quite important, or we might just be looking where the light is and mm -hmm. putting the rabbit in the hat, making these models that play out a certain way, maybe even deterministically, because they've been kind of told a secret in the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I, I have a more, I have a more um, question, and then and then I'll hear Jakob. So, um, you juxtaposed and contrasted three different approaches, which were mm -hmm. variational message passing, Bayesian filtering, and belief propagation, yeah. and whether for didactic or pragmatic use, where do you see these different? approaches as being useful or specialized 
yeah. where are they better or where is one a generalization or a special case of another? So, um, for example, Bayer-Schneider message passing. So, the way we structure the model in Bayer-Schneider message passing is that we keep track of the past. And each time we get new observation into, inside of, uh, into the future. So, let me maybe just go here. Um, oh, no. Yeah. So, okay. So, in Bayer-Schneider message passing, for example, we keep the past. And this is quite interesting because when you have Bayer-Schneider message passing, you can also have backward messages, which means that as you get a new observation, you will have an, an echo like the state associated to it. And what is going to happen is that you will have a message like this, and you will also have messages that go backward in times. And this, those messages will enable you to refine your understanding of what happened in the past. So this ability to revisit, like, or you know, update your understanding about the past is something which is quite uh, specific to the Weierstein message passing algorithm and does not appear, for example, in Bayesian filtering in the Bayesian filtering setting, because we only keep um, a mm. belief state of um, over the current random variable. And when we expand, like when we get a new observation um, and a new state associated to it, we are just going to perform prediction uh, to get the posterior, and then we are going to get rid of that. So we cannot have those backward messages um, to update the posterior beliefs over past states. Uh, so we can't really have this kind of counterfactual abilities. Now with the belief propagation algorithm, uh, basically it's very similar in ID to what is done uh, with the belief propagation in the belief propagation settings. It is just a more scalable approach, um, which enables one to have uh, different item states and different observation because this. BTIBF uh, approach was only restricted to one observation and one state. And if you have, for example, the exposition tomorrow, the exposition of the text of as a disparate environment, then you will need to create one random variable that corresponds to all the combination of those X and Y position. So maybe it will be a random variable describing the position. And if we had two value for each of the, you know, for the X position, as a y position, then all the combination will be like four, uh, each of the value for one uh, times all the, the value for the other. And, and this grows exponentially with the number of variables. So let's suppose we have now a scale variable, and that this scale variable can take two additional values, and then the total number of combinations of those three random variables will be like eight. Eight possible combinations, basically all the x and y position for each of the two scale uh, possibility maybe scale one and scale two. And this exponential growth become problematic if you don't have this ability to have several observations and several states, because you will have an exponential growth in the number of state and, and observation you try to model. And this is where really like the, the other approach, uh, multi, um, multi-factor and multimodality is really uh, useful to scale to a more complicated approach with more states and observations. Excellent. Ali or Jakob, any closing questions or thoughts? Uh, well, uh, you see, I came across your work a few months ago, and it got me truly excited so much that I read all five of your uh, papers. Uh, is it uh, is a number five, right? I mean, uh, you published yeah. uh, five papers uh, up to now, uh, because you see, uh, more often than not, people see active inference and uh, the, few, uh, the free energy principle as uh, basically speculative uh, thinking and endeavor uh, without so much pragmatic value in the real applications. So uh, in my opinion, uh, your work, as I mentioned, is a very welcome addition to this uh, nascent yet um, exponentially uh, growing field. Uh, and I hope to see uh, more exciting developments in the future uh, for branching time active inference or possibly the other uh, variants uh, you might come up with in the future. Uh, and uh, I'll definitely keep following your work from now on. 
So thanks so much for your joining us today. No, no problem. And thank you for inviting me. I'm really glad I could present here. So thank you for the invitation. Jakob, any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, well, this has been a really great presentation and discussion. Uh, Ali also uh, linked uh, your work a couple of months ago and it also uh, got me very excited for uh, for the um, future of active inference modeling. And it's a, it's a topic that we're um, discussing uh, quite a lot in the in the institute and um i think that this approach to reducing the computational cost of of uh of perform of performing um active inference in more and more complex state spaces is probably the best way to go uh to really um reach adoption of, of these models in in different in different domains. So yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much for uh for joining today. And uh I look forward to reading that paper on on the deep active inference, deep branching time active inference. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're welcome back anytime and we will um certainly be observing. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Perfect. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> really, Andrew.